us pray. <clears throat> Father, today's uh, message, if there ever was something the enemy doesn't want us to be really studying, it would be what we're looking at today, and that's the reality of the enemy. So, Father, I ask that you will do what only you can do, and precious Holy Spirit, we ask now that you will cut through any distraction, cut through anything that has got our minds preoccupied with the things of our own lives or the things of the world or worries or concerns, whatever it may be, oh God, we pray that we will hear your spirit and your truth will not be hindered in any way. So Lord, I ask that you please move me out of the way, my thoughts and reasonings out of the way, all of our thoughts and reasonings out of the way. Holy Spirit, we are your students you're our teacher, and we sit at your feet to learn. And so we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 6. Today we wrap up the series on Ephesians. It's been good. I've really enjoyed this book, uh, and it's been interesting to me to hear other pastors who have shared, and we didn't really know this was happening, uh, that I, in, in our talks that they're kind of walking through Ephesians. Actually, I, talk, I had lunch with Ernie Perkle the other day, and he said he's been walking through the book of Ephesians. He's, uh, right now, Ernie is an interim pastor uh, at Rothwell Baptist here in town, so he's filling in until they find a pastor, so I'll be praying for him. But he was sharing that he's walking through the same thing. Another friend of mine was saying the same thing. So it's interesting to me how God seems that he's leading us as his church to look at who we are and what we're to do. And how we're to live. And I believe that that's uh, a, a, a huge point of that is that God wants us to walk in his confidence. Right? To know who we are and to know how to live so that we can trust him in all that we do. So the first three chapters of Ephesians we talked about was Paul teaching the church in Ephesus who they are. That they'd been redeemed. They'd been adopted. They'd been forgiven. They were children of God. They'd gone from death to life. They had all these spiritual blessings. And then he shifts over in chapters 4, 5, and 6 into now how they're supposed to live and how they're just supposed to treat one another, live in unity, how they're to operate as a church. And now today he sums up this whole letter by saying, okay, I told you all of that because you need to be prepared because there's a spiritual war going on. There are things that you can't see, but God can see them. And they're very real. So you got to know who you are first. You got to know what I've told you how to live and be aware then how to live because these things do exist in the spiritual world of evil, darkness, demons, uh, and Satan's schemes. So today we're looking at unseen things, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, now, uh, I found this random internet article the other day about unseen things, everyday common things, or sometimes maybe not so common, uh, that uh, they exist, but to the naked eye, you don't see them. I wanted to show you some of them. Here's, here's the first one right here. This is the space shuttle leaving our atmosphere. Uh, we wouldn't see that with the naked eye, but that's pretty amazing, right? Here's another one. Uh, that is a human embryo on the end of a needle. Incredible. The human eye can't see that. What's the next one? This is the inside of a guitar. Looks like a pretty cool apartment, doesn't it? <laughs> Here's the next one. This is the inside of a pearl. The next one. This is the inside of a bowling ball. Never thought it looked like that. The next one. This is the inside of a safe door from the 1800s. This is the inside of an air mattress. Looks like some kind of an alien movie, right? The inside of a turtle. This is the inside of your pastor's head. <laughs> now that wasn't in the article, but hey, you know, I'm just calling it like I see it. Uh, my wife disagrees with that one. Uh, this, this is the underside of a lily pad. This is the backstage of a theater. This is behind the screen in a movie theater. This, anybody know what that is? It's kind of hard to tell in that picture. Oh, look at you experts. This is behind the wall in a bowling alley. And this one is a uh, 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 modern-day uh, battleship 
outside of the water. Now, my sons would be like, that is sick. That's how they would say that. That is sick. All right? Don't normally see it that way. This is the uh, air control room in Beijing. And this is the inside of Space Mountain with the lights on. <laughs> things that you normally don't see. There's a lot of things in the world that exist. They're real, but we don't see them all the time. They, they really are there, but we can't visually recognize them. And in the same light, there is a lot that happens in the spiritual world that we don't see. Angels, demons, good forces of, from, from, from God that are at work, uh, evil forces from the enemy that are at work. My friend Jeff Rollins used to say, isn't it amazing how the things that are not so real we can see and touch, but the things that are the most real we can't see nor touch. And today Paul, Paul talks about this spiritual war or the reality of evil, demonic forces, activities of Satan in the world. So here's what he says in uh, chapter 6, verse 10. He says, okay, now keep in mind who you are, all you have, and how you're to live. Now, with all that in mind, he says, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now by heavenly realms, he means basically by everything that's been created. So Paul's saying, be strong in the Lord, remember who you are, put on the armor, get ready so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes because they're going to come. There is going to be that adversary working against us. He gives this hierarchy of demonic power, rulers, authorities, powers of the dark world, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And, 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 and most of this we can see kind of how it's played out in scripture. Let's kind of get a little, a little um, uh, I hate to put it this way, Satan 101, <laughs> okay? Uh, where Satan came from and where evil uh, came from. God creates the world, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Lucifer was the most beautiful angel in heaven, but he was prideful. Angels could have free will, otherwise they couldn't worship, they have to choose to worship. And Lucifer chose to rebel against God. He was very, he became prideful in um, Ezekiel chapter 28 where he basically gets a story from uh, the Bible about Lucifer. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper. Lopus, lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created. They were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub. Now, in that passage... Ezekiel is talking about the king of Tyre, and the king of Tyre, uh, Tyre was basically a, a city that was condemned by many of the prophets, Isaiah 23, Jeremiah 25, Ezekiel 26, Joel chapter 3, Amos 1. Tyre was condemned by the prophets because it was a, a city of idol idolatry, of sexual immorality, and the the prophets mention the inhabitants of that city as being very prideful and very greedy. In Ezekiel 28, the prophecy says the king of Tyre, but most Bible scholars believe this is also a double condemnation because it's talking about Satan and the fall of Satan. It, it's, it's a prophecy about Satan or it's a, it's a teaching about Satan using a human example. The reason they get that is because in this passage I just read you, he says that the king of Tyre was in Eden, the original garden that God created. He was anointed a guardian cherub. It was on the holy mountain of God. And because of these details, 
scholars accept that the pride of the king of Tyre, the pride of the king of Tyre, is being compared to the pride of Satan. And so that's where we get this idea of Satan falling from heaven. Satan rebelled against God. We read about more of that in Isaiah 14. And he convinced many angels to follow him in Revelation 12. This is a real being who fell from heaven because of his pride and convinced others to follow him. Demons. When that happened, God promised in the garden, he tells Satan, you will strike his heel, meaning Jesus, but he will crush your head. So God establishes very early on, there is this enmity between God and man. There are these forces between good and evil, but God will win. Jesus has won. We have nothing to fear. However, we will have struggles. We will face these forces. It will strike your heel, he said, talking about Jesus. It will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. This is not a story of good versus evil, but it is a story of how those of us who are walking in a relationship with God can endure evil until we're in a place where we're completely void of evil in heaven. Paul says the power of sin is still at work within us, Romans 7, John 12, John 14, John 16, Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of the world, which means he has a lot of influence, but the prince is not the king. He may have a lot of influence, but he doesn't have total control. And so there is that force that we work against, and, and throughout scripture we see where Jesus dealt specifically with demons, evil spirits fleshing themselves out on the earth. Mark chapter 1, Luke 4, while teaching in a synagogue, Jesus was approached by a a man possessed by a demon, and and Jesus cast the demon out. Matthew 8, Mark 5, and Luke 8, Jesus came across a man who was possessed by demons who'd been living in a graveyard. And when the man comes to him, calls out to Jesus, what do you want with us? Uh, And and Jesus says, what's your name? And and basically the the man, the demon says, legion, which is many. And remember the story, Jesus cast all those demons into a, a herd of pigs and they ran off the cliff. This is real stuff that happened. Matthew 12, Mark 3, Luke 11, Jesus cast a demon out of a mute man. Luke 4, Jesus rebuked demons. Mark 6, Mark, uh, Matthew 10, and Luke 9, Jesus sent out the disciples to have authority over evil spirits. Matthew 8, 12, 17, and Luke 4 tells us that demons know who Jesus is. And Mark 5 tells us that demons are terrified of him. A demon hears the name of Jesus, they flee. That's why sometimes when we feel oppressed, we feel depressed, and we feel like the struggle is too much for us, if the only thing we can say is Jesus, that's enough. So these These spirits, they really do exist. Now you say, well, that was then, this is now. I hadn't seen a a mute man uh, have a demon cast out of him. Maybe you have seen some activity such as that. Most of you may have not. So we might have a tendency to think these are just like biblical illustrations that don't apply today, that demons aren't really real, they're in movies. Well, I beg to differ. Demons... Evil spirits whisper in our ears all the time to influence us to walk away from God's will or to crush us into destroying us and the life he has intended for us. And he's no respecter of persons. The the strongest, most intelligent, um, the highest on the ladder in every way can be affected by evil. Suicide. Someone dies to uh, suicide every 11 minutes in the United States. In 2020, 12.2 million Americans thought about suicide. 1.2 million Americans attempted suicide. Are these bad people? No. Are they being taught a lie? Are they they being pushed into a place of fear? Have they 
been convinced that there is no hope in their life. Maybe you have been one of those people and tried. Maybe you know someone who has tried. You're not the problem. You're, you're, not, you're, you're not evil. You've had something influencing you to try to destroy you. Marriages torn apart every day because of lies the enemy says that he wants us to believe. Murder, 400,000 die from homicide in America each year. Child abuse, the U.S. is one of the worst records among industrialized nations about child abuse, losing five children a day to, the, to abuse and neglect. Where does that come from? It comes from the pit of hell. 200, uh, 2019, um, state agencies found 656,000 victims of child abuse. That would fill 10 football stadiums. You can't tell me that Satan and evil does not stand in the wings and snicker and snuff and laugh at what he's doing to these children. Sex, in 1999, 2000, a survey was done, 68% of television contained sexual content. I told you last week that 60-something percent of all internet activity is pornography. Uh, the enemy gets into the minds and distorts things that God meant for good, makes them destructive. This causes us, he causes us, or the evil force causes us to not know who we are, where we're going, how to leverage life, and anything behind all that would be evil, from the biggest to the smallest things. And so the, all of this is relevant to us today. So if this is real, and this exists, then what should we do? Well, Paul says, it's time to suit up, boys. It's time to be ready. You can't avoid this stuff in the, in the sense of experiencing it, but it's time to get ready and that you have nothing to fear because your armor is enough. So how do we do this? He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, verse 13, the full armor of God. Notice he says that full armor, so he's suggesting that there are all these weapons that God gives us are to work in concert with one another in order to make this armor work. So he says, put it all on, not just a piece of it. Don't just cover your head. Don't just cover your heart. Don't just pray. Don't just be in the Word. Put it all together. Because this is an intense fight. Satan is aggressive, and we must be. So he says, load the bear. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, not if the day of evil comes, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You go back and underline that, with which you can, you can, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I, I mentioned to you earlier, I was talking to Ernie at lunch the other day, and we were talking about some various things. We were kind of talking about this a little bit, and, and, and Ernie made a great statement. He said, you know, sometimes the enemy wins because we're convinced that our that we can and we need to change our can't to be honest and just say I won't which is so much of now I, I get it there's a lot of things we struggle with especially in the world of addiction because I asked him I said what are you doing about, about addiction and, and yes addiction is very real all, I believe all of us are addicted to something so so you when we struggle with those addictions we still have to the very first step of, a, a, of a addiction counseling is to recognize that there's a higher power that we can't do it ourselves. So even in addiction, we can still win. We have to change our I can't uh, uh, change our, our wants to to we can. Okay, I guess got all off track on that one. But anyway, in addition to all this, verse 16 says, "Take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word." Of God. Now, this is usually where we break down all the pieces of the armor and talk about what each piece means. So I'm going to kind of do that, but in a different way. There are, there are basically, I think, three ways that you can practically fight the enemy. All right? And we'll find these pieces within them. 
But there are three ways I, that I feel like we go to war. We know the truth, we establish borders, and we pray. That's it. Know the truth, establish borders, and pray. We start with know the truth. John 8, 40, 8.44 tells us that Satan is the father of lies. Revelation 12, 9 tells us he deceives the whole world. Satan's number one use of attack is a lie. He, he started in the garden with Eve. Oh, you know, you, you, you're not going to die. That it started with a lie. And, and he, he attacks us on every point with a lie. And he changes every day. His story constantly changes. The voices in our head, the influences of evil around us. They're constantly changing. Our God never changes, so we can anchor to him. But when the enemy comes, he wants to, to deceive. And so everything changes depending on the situations. Neil Anderson says the enemy is a chameleon. He'll change. That's why you don't see much instruction from Scripture about Satan's tactics for the simple reason he's a liar. He'll just change tomorrow. Whereas the opposite is true of God, he's the same yesterday, day, and tomorrow, he'll never change. And it's because of that eternal consistency that I have stability in my life. Satan will lie to you about who you are. He lies to me about who I am. You're stupid. You'll never get it. And maybe these are things that, that were launched at you from, from somebody years ago. Maybe as a child, something lodged in your mind from something someone said. And do you think that the enemy is not behind that? That's why it's so critical. Every word we say to a child is so very critical that we don't become a channel to which the enemy takes a shot and lodges some lie that grows. People talk about you. People don't like you. Did you see that guy, the way he looked at you? That woman over there, she's out to get you. Your boss is going to fire you. Your employees are going to quit on you. Your spouse is not respecting you. Whatever the lie is, he will, he will convince us of something that's not true about ourselves. When we look in the mirror, we don't, if we don't see ourselves from Scripture, we'll hear, we leave the door open for the enemy to tell us all kind of garbage. If we start believing that, then we wither. Not only can we believe bad things about ourselves, we can believe bad, good things about ourselves. We can believe that we're a little bit more than we really are. Pride. Oh, you're a little bit smarter than those. Oh, uh, yeah, you, you get it, they don't. Oh, uh, your race is superior. Oh, uh, your social class is a little bit more advanced. Uh, oh, your, your nation uh, is better than other people. There's nothing wrong with, with having respect and, and loving and, res and, and having pride with healthy pride over our families and our lives and our nation. But when it becomes looking down on others, that's Satan lying about who we are. Satan lies about relationships. If you're not happy, leave her. If he doesn't deserve you anyway, get rid of him. If they hurt you, cut them off. Cut them out of your life. Lies about relationships and how to handle them. And Satan always says, trust your feelings. Hey, if you feel it, do it. I mean, after all, you want to be sincere, right? Respond to everything how you feel. See where that gets us. And all of that is a lie from Satan about relationships. He lies about consequences. You're only human. Everybody does it. It's not going to be that bad. They'll never know. All of those things. He lies about the church. You don't need it. You need the extra rest. They just want your money anyway. You can worship just fine on your own. He, he, Satan lies about God. And I think this one right here is what throws 90% of us off. You ever have a hard time understanding how much God loves you? What do you think distracts us from that? You ever have a hard time understanding the grace of God and the goodness of God? What do you think is in there trying to twist our mind into thinking that God hates us, that we don't deserve His forgiveness, and He doesn't want anything to do with us? Where's that coming from? 
It's not from a book. It's not from man's intelligence. It's from the pit of hell. It's from Satan whispering lies to us about who God really is. Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, says, The fall also entrenched in our minds dark thoughts of God. Thoughts that are only dug out over multiple expo- exposures to the gospel over many years. Perhaps Satan's biggest victory in your life today is not the sin in which you regularly indulge, but dark thoughts of God's heart that cause you to go there in the first place and keep you cool toward him in the wake of it. See, if Satan can get us to doubt God's goodness, we don't want to approach God. But John 1.14 says, God is Full of grace and truth. That is the truth. 1 John 4, 17 tells us that God is love. Exodus 34, 6 says that he is merciful. Psalm 86, 15 reminds us God is compassionate. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that he's patient toward you. Numbers 14, Psalm 103, Psalm 145 tell us that he's slow to anger, abounding in love. That's the truth. Satan don't want us to know that. John Calvin said, men are wont to judge and measure God from themselves. For their hearts are moved by angry passion and are very difficult to be appeased. And therefore they think that they cannot be reconciled to God. And when they have offended him, but the Lord shows that he is far from resembling men. God doesn't respond to us like we respond to each other. I mean, it's Isaiah 55, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's not just saying God's smarter than us, God's bigger than us, God's up here and we're down here. That's saying God is much good, better and he, He's so good that we can't comprehend it. His thoughts, His ways are much better than anything we can even put in our our own brains. Dane Orton says, The way in which his thoughts are higher than ours is that we do not realize just how low he delights to come. Isaiah 57, 15. The Lord says, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the heart of the lowly. Where is the heart of God, Orland says, the unspeakable, exalted one, naturally drawn to the lowly? When Jesus showed up 700 years after Isaiah prophesied and revealed his deepest heart as gently and lowly, he was proving once and for all that gentle lowliness is indeed where God loves to dwell. It is what he does. It is who he is. His ways are not our ways. So when you think that you have gone too far for God to love you, hear the truth. You can't go too far for God not to love you. Satan wants us to give up, to stop pursuing the love and the grace of God, but his ways are higher. His love is deeper. Paul says he's put on the breastplate of righteousness. This is part of knowing the truth. Because the, pre- the breastplate covers your heart. It covers vital organs in your body. And the most important thing we must understand is that our righteousness comes from Christ, not ourselves. When we get that, then we understand that we're safe in what he's done for us and we know the truth. Now you say, well, Darren, how, do I, how then do I know what the truth is? I mean, this all sounds kind of you know, ambiguous. How, how do I really then know the truth? If I'm supposed to know the truth and find security, how do I know that truth? Right here. Right here. This is it. There's not a single word in this book that's a lie. Not one. Everything in these pages is the truth. John 17, 17, Jesus prayed in the upper room for his disciples before he was arrested and crucified. And he prayed and said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Where the enemy begins to win is when we start saying, you know what, God? I know, I know it says that there, but we're going to do this here. I mean, I, I, we, don't really need to, we don't really need to go into that. Because we got our own ideas. 
wander from this, and trust me, 100%, it is Satan in the corner saying, you want God. You want God. Define your life like you want it. Define yourself like you want it. Define the world like you want it. You come up with your own ideas. This is the 21st century for Pete's sake. You want God? Shut this book. Truth Society. Know the truth. Once I know the truth, what am I supposed to do with it? I have to establish borders. Now that I know the truth, I've got to obey the truth. I, I, I've got to now put the truth into practice. I, I, I've got to put on the helmet of salvation to guard my brain with this truth. I, I've got to, to pick up the shield of faith to guard against what the enemy throws at me. There needs to be something between me and the enemy, and I've got to use it. I can't just say I believe it. I've got to put it into practice. That's obedience. So I take that helmet, I take that shield, I take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word, and I use it, and I obey God. Whatever He says, I am to do. Yeah, it's it's hard. Yes, it's hard to obey. Yes, there are times when we're going to stumble. Yes, there are times when we're going to struggle. But we never disagree with God. We always agree with Him and continue to go back to Him and put it into practice so that we can establish those borders that basically say, listen, Satan, enemy, whatever force that is evil out there, you have no authority in this realm. You have no authority over my home, over my marriage, over my church, over my life. Why? Because I know what the truth is and I'm determined that I'm going to live according to it. Will I struggle? Yeah, but I'm always going to go back to it. And I'm always going to seek to make this my border. Within this border, I find safety. The Parma shield is a smaller shield that the soldiers would use. The Scudum shield was the larger shield that they would use. It was two to three feet tall, about three feet, four feet wide. And these shields were wrapped in leather, dipped in water. They were incredibly heavy, some of them 30 to 50 pounds. They would oftentimes put these shields in the ground like a door and hide under them. They would, they would get in groups together uh, like, like a, um, they called it like a, um, a, a testudo, where we get the word tortoise, like a tortoise shell. And together, using their shields, Obeying the Lord, basically what Paul's saying here, we're strong. The Bible often refers to God himself as our shield. Genesis 14, David said, the Lord's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield. Genesis 14, the Lord said to Abram, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Psalm 115, David says, o, o Israel, trust in the Lord, he is your helper and your shield. God tells us, listen, I'll give you the truth. Now, when you walk in the truth, establish those borders, make a determination in your own. Listen, it's a choice. It is a choice. Obedience does not come by osmosis. It is a choice that we say, okay, I will now submit myself to this truth. I will establish that border, and I will live in your security. Does that mean that danger will not come? Does that mean that death will not come? Does that mean that heartache will not come? Absolutely not. Those things will happen. But if I'm walking in obedience to the Lord, I'm in His hands. I am safe. I am secure. No matter what comes, that's the border. Tony Evans says, faith is acting like God is telling the truth. And when we take up the shield of faith, we're saying, God, I may not understand it, but I believe it's truth and I'll follow it. That's what taking the shield of faith is. That's establishing the border. So we know the truth, we establish the border, and then the last thing we do is we pray. Now listen to me. This is game on right here. He says, pray in the Spirit, verse 18, on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. You see that? Paul says, hey, y'all got to pray for each other. You can't do this by yourself. Pray for all the Lord's people and keep on doing it. Pray also for me. Paul was not egotistical enough to say, hey, I got it covered. Don't worry about me. He's saying, pray for me. I need it. I can't do it without 
God's power. He says, whenever I speak, words, pray so that when I speak, words may be given me that, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. When we pray, we are fighting evil. This is not just sit in your chair and, and crochet a blanket and say, you know, Jesus bless the children, whatever. This is getting on our knees and saying, Almighty God, the enemy wants to destroy my kids. He wants to convince them that they're not who they are. He wants to tell them lies. He wants to pull them into addictions. He wants to destroy their relationships. He wants to throw them off course. Fight for them. Protect them. The enemy wants to get in my marriage. He wants me to be prideful and arrogant. He wants me to stake my claim. He wants me to fight. God, show me how to be the husband you need me to be. The enemy might, wants to wedge his way in the church. Yeah, all things are going good, but, but there's always something the enemy might want to put in there, God. And I am not foolish enough to know that there's not some stinking evil spirit trying to sneak in these doors. So God protect us every Sunday. Oh, there's a table there. Every Sunday morning. God protect me from the table. Every Sunday morning, and I mean this, we pray that distractions, that evil will be kept at bay. We pray that the Spirit of God will touch every seat in this place, every person in every seat in this place. I pray that God will guard us from the enemy's schemes so that we can hear him, we can respond to him, we can know him. Why? Because this is a war zone, folks. But it's nothing we have to fear. It's also a launching pad. This is where we hear from God his purposes for our life and, and know his truth. So, so, of course, Satan doesn't want us to hear. So we fight. When we moved into our homes, before we moved in, we bought the house. Before we moved in, I walked around that entire property. I went in every single bedroom. I went in every room. And I prayed God's blessing, his guidance, his protection over every single room. Has it always been perfect in our house? No, by, not by any means. Has it always been struggles? Yes, we got struggles. Always have and always will. But one thing I am sure of, Satan don't like us. And he doesn't like you. He doesn't want any of us to accomplish God's purposes in the world. And so he's going to try. But I ain't worried about that. Because I don't talk to Satan. I don't address Satan. I don't talk to demons. I let my father take care of that. I talk to him. If I get afraid, I say, Jesus, I'm afraid. If I get worried, I say, Lord, help my heart. Uh, if, if there's a struggle, I need wisdom. God, I need you to show me what to do. When I fail, I say, God, forgive me. We don't let the enemy get a foothold. Several months ago, I felt like the Lord laid on my heart that we as a city need to be praying. So, so we're going to begin an initiative for the city of Savannah. Probably hear more about this throughout the year. It may take place at the end of this year. We don't know, but... Me and a couple other pastors are praying over this. It's called Prayer in the Square. And the vision of this is to have, there are 22 squares, downtown Savannah, is to have our Savannah churches choose one square. And on one day, out of the year, we had not picked it yet, we're going to go to our square. We're going to pray for the Spirit of God to move in Savannah, Georgia. So we're going to ask God to do what only God can do. Is This is not a demonstration. There, we're gonna make we're gonna make it pretty stringent. There's no there's no posters, signs, t-shirts, flags, any of that stuff. So any of the confusing stuff that Satan wants to throw in there, no, we're gonna we're gonna work against that. So we're gonna pray before we pray, and then we're gonna go to a square and we're just gonna pray. We're gonna ask God to let His Spirit move in this city. And somebody asked the other day, so what is the result of this? And the answer is. I don't know. The only thing I know is that if God calls us to pray, we'll pray, and then we'll stand back and see what he does. Right? So we do that for the city. Let's do it for our homes. Pray over your house. Pray over your square. Pray over your neighbors. Sidlow Baxter 
a theologian by the name of Sidlow Baxter said, men may spurn our appeals, reject our message, oppose our arguments, despite, despise our person, but they are helpless against our prayer. Martin Luther said, prayer is a strong wall and a fortress of the church. It is a goodly Christian weapon. John Piper says that prayer is the open admission that without Christ we can do nothing. And prayer is the turning away from ourselves to God and the confidence that he will provide the help we need. Prayer humbles us as needy and exalts God as wealthy. John Wesley says God does nothing but by prayer and everything with it. So church, know this, 100%, this is a church of prayer. That's why we have this vision of having a place of prayer back here. It has nothing to do with growing pretty flowers. It has everything to do with waging war against what the enemy wants to do in our homes, our families, our jobs, our country, in this world. That's our vision. This church will be on our knees. But saying that, I know that God tells me, Darren, they won't be there if you're not there. So I'm challenging myself as much as I'm challenging you. Know the truth. Establish the borders and pray. It's the only way that we'll win. Father, we know we have victory in you, Lord, because of what you've done for us on the cross. Eternal victory is ours, but we could still walk in a lot of earthly bondage if we allow Satan to have his way. So will you convict us, drive us, give us a passion to be people of prayer? And then, Lord, when you reveal yourself in various ways, various things you call us to do, may we be obedient in every one of those ways to fulfill your purposes on the earth and your purpose for our life. God, we love you. We thank you for all your faithfulness and goodness in all of our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.